right, everybody. So today we have Matty Fusero on. What's up, man? What's going on, dude? How are you? So I'm glad we were able to connect. Um, basically, I noticed that we followed each other on Instagram. Um, I had heard about you, and I kind of I want to get into your background. But basically, I mean, I had, I knew your name. I can't say that like I was like following you for a long time, but I knew of you, and then I looked at your page and I, I saw some of the stuff that you were putting out, and I liked it. So I wanted to get you on. Um, before we delve into your background, though, I wanted to start, as with all of the podcasts, with a charity donation. And so today's, we chose, so you didn't know a specific Breast Cancer Foundation, but uh, you had mentioned that your mom had passed from breast cancer a long time ago. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, back when I was four years old, so quite a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I like when there's some personal touch to some of these. And so I had another guest do the uh, Susan G. Komen Breast Cancer Foundation. So that's where I'll donate to today. And just for everybody listening, as always, there will be a link in the show notes and the YouTube description if you want to donate there as well. Perfect. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, sure. So, Maddie, uh, what is your background? Because I know you've been lifting for a long time. Um, you know, you make a lot of posts about natural bodybuilding and all of that. So for people who maybe have just heard your name or don't know you at all, how did you get into this? All right. So I'll, I'll keep it short. Uh, Back, I, I guess in, well, just really growing up, my whole upbringing, I was the overweight, insecure kid, always involved in sports, always stayed active, was always on teams. And I would say I was actually pretty damn good at sports, but I just loved food way too much. So yeah. I, I, <laughs> it didn't negate the amount of calories I was eating. And uh, yeah, so just growing up, just very self-conscious, the kid who wore the shirt at the pool and at the beach and avoided pool parties and water parks and all that. And I just, at that age, it was just so... Oh, man, it's like that's when you're developing as as a man. That's when you're, you know, dealing with, I guess you could say bullying and all that, which luckily I didn't have to deal with too much. A lot of the people, it never actually came up. People were just cool with me. And I was, yeah. but I just wasn't happy with who I was. I wasn't happy with what I saw in the mirror. So, yeah, it was pretty much around high school where I decided to try and get in shape. And I didn't know anything. We didn't have social media. We didn't have all these websites. It was really just whatever we read in the magazine or whoever we saw in the gym and you would just take advice from whoever looked best. So, right, right. yeah, I started doing everything wrong, man. I was, I didn't know what a macros were or anything like that. All I knew was do a ton of cardio, don't eat too much food and see what happens. So yeah, yeah I, you know, over the years, I obviously lost some weight the wrong way, but I was interested in learning a lot more about it. So started reading a lot more about it and yeah, so then I decided to start a YouTube channel because I thought if I can get in somewhat decent shape and lose the weight, then maybe I can help someone else do it. And through years and years of research and self-education and I, you know, personal training at some local gyms around here, I, uh, I put my first video out, which was terrible. But, you know, a couple of people watched it, left some comments. And from there... How long ago was that? Uh, 2011. Okay. Yeah, so quite a long time ago. So since then, about 900 videos... And uh, many years of lifting and learning, and here we are today. So that's awesome, man. Yeah, yeah. We actually have kind of a similar story in that regard. So I was also fat kid. Um, definitely have some pictures where I'm like in a pool with a shirt on and all that. And I actually, like you, I was never really bullied. You know, I don't know if like I ever had anybody call me like fat or anything like that. It wasn't really a thing, fortunately. Um, but I, you know, I saw abs like on other people and I really, really wanted that. Uh, so I started losing weight. I got too skinny, but I started getting compliments. You know, a girl I had a crush on was like joking, like, oh, like give me your number type of thing. And so, you know, that fed the ego and then you just go down that rabbit hole. Um, and then fortunately I had pretty good, I wouldn't say mentors like in real life, but like I knew about like Tom Venuto and, and guys like that early on. Um, so that at least had me down the right path. And it's funny, like looking back on it, because at the time I felt very frustrated because I never felt like I was progressing as well as I thought I should have. But, you know, definitely some rosy retrospection going on where I look back at that time and it, it's like, man, it was nice to actually make some progress back then. <laughs> like, you know, when you're <laughs> only a couple years into it. So um, it sounds like we kind of went through a similar path there and then eventually got to it in a healthier way. And, and yeah, for sure. When did you actually go through that? Like, how, how old are you? So I was, I started dieting when I was 10. Um, I was motivated from like a pretty young age. I was just always okay. like goal driven. Like I remember, I'll always remember when I was eight years old running around the park, like just to run, like for cardio, not like to play a sport. <laughs> and I remember seeing these two old, like an old couple. And I remember hearing the uh, guy be like, oh, I wonder how long he'll run. 
And the woman, like the wife, was like, oh, just until he's tired. In my head, my like eight-year-old head thinking like, I'm already tired, but I'm going to keep going. <laughs> like, like even back then, you know? <laughs> so it was uh, definitely started early. And then probably 2005, so it would have been like eighth grade for me. Um, I was, I started to actually like work out, not just like do cardio. Um, and like you, I was always pretty athletic. I was decent at sports. Um, I never took them like super seriously, but the ones I did, I, I was pretty good at. Um, but yeah, it's definitely been a journey. So I was going to actually ask you, so some people will laugh and be like, oh, everybody asks about like body fat stats or, you know, weight stats and everything. And it's almost like a joke. Like sometimes we'll see like, Hey, what's your height, weight, body fat percentage, arm measurements. Like I need all of that, you know? And yeah. in one sense I do laugh because like it's silly, like relax, like it's just a picture. However, I actually do like to know that information because, and obviously we'll, we'll delve into this, but a lot of bodybuilding and what you see on, online is illusion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can have, I think I just saw a post of yours where you said, you know, you could have somebody who's 160 pounds with the right lighting and pump and everything look like a 190 pound monster because of how the picture is. And then you see them in person and it's like, oh, like they look a lot different. Um, and of course we all do it. You know, I'll post pictures that look great and you meet me in person and you're like, eh, I guess he kind of lifts, you know, <laughs> but so it, it's all different. But I like to have that perspective um, just to kind of put real numbers in people's head, especially for naturals, mm -hmm. because most of the time, even the guys you think are like huge, they're probably competing in like the 160s, 170s, Dude, things like that. I'm not gonna lie. I, this was the most shocking thing I've ever seen. So this past, I guess it was a couple of months ago, was the first time I ever went to an, an actual all natural bodybuilding show. Mm. I went to the, uh, I wanna say it was the WNBF Long Island Championship, I think. Okay. And uh, I met up with like Chris Barricat and all of them. And I've only been to, I mean, I did a natural show myself. So I saw like what some naturals looked like, but mm -hmm. we're talking the people you see on Instagram that are absolutely freaky. Yeah, you see them in person and you are shocked at how small really? they are. I mean, conditioned like crazy, insane, like muscle bellies and all that. But man, they are small. And really? it, that was very eye opening to me. Yeah. So well, how tall are you? Six foot. Six foot. Okay. So that's another thing that like, I don't mean to be a hater on like short people at all, but <laughs> I do think in <laughs> bodybuilding, a lot of people are on the shorter end. Um, like I have a friend who looks crazy, but and he's like five probably like five, five, um, crazy in pictures. And like, we always called him like little Justin because he was just a tiny guy and he's, I don't know, maybe 140, 145, but his pictures, I'm like, this guy's on steroids. He, he definitely, he, he jumped on and he's definitely on and I'll see him in person. I'm like, Oh, like, I, how do you look like this? So, yeah. and at, you know, a, I wouldn't say a normal height, but at like being a little bit above average height, you know, six foot and I'm right around six one. It's, it is different, especially when you you're standing next to some of these people. So what did you what would you say you walk around at and what did you compete at? Pretty much always walking around around 180. OK, uh, I pushed myself to around 190 before, but I competed at, oh, man, like 158, 159. <laughs> OK, so we're probably okay. pretty similar. Like if we were if, like, you know, we were meet up, um, we're probably pretty similar because right now I'm sitting at 199 this morning, but I'm definitely not as lean as you like at least looking at your most recent pictures, I'm definitely not that lean. Um, and I've unfortunately said that if I competed, I, ugh, I, I think I'd probably be like low one sixties, unfortunately. Like, I don't like to say it. I don't like to believe it, but I've seen me at one eighty, and I'm like, you got a lot left to go, you know? So it's, <laughs> which is why I don't compete. <laughs> yeah. Then that's the funny thing about natural bodybuilding. The people who are somewhat lean at one eighty, they're like, yeah, if I lose 10, 15 pounds, I'll be good. It's like, you have no idea. <laughs> right. I right. didn't know either. You know, I, I thought I could maybe get on stage in like 170, high 160s. And then I was like another 10 pounds after that. So, yeah. And, and I wasn't even as conditioned as I could have been. So it, it's crazy when you, yeah, real naturals, man, it's, it's not a joke. <laughs> it is crazy. Yeah. I mean, if, and even if you look at like Alberto Nunez, like he's somebody who people would say has great genetics. Mm -hmm. He said himself that when he started working out, he blew past his friends, right? Both in size and strength. He is five nine and competes at like one sixty, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that is big. I mean, he is a big guy for a natural. Um, but I mean, I don't know if you've ever met him in person. I haven't, but I would imagine that standing next to him, he's smaller than in pictures. Um, I think Jeff Alberts competes about one seventy. He and he's probably one of the bigger naturals you're going to see. Yeah. Jeff Alberts. You know, Eric is probably about Eric Helms is probably about our height. Um, and he competes at like 183, which is again, big. I mean, you oh, think wow. okay, that's... you can, 
Yeah, if you compete at 158, I mean, you're talking 20 plus pounds more muscle at the same height. That's that's a big guy, you know, again, for a natural. But I think, and this is something that I know you talk about, how skewed the perceptions are for natural. So maybe you can delve into that a little bit here is just like what we see versus reality, not only just pictures versus um, in person, but when we see people on Instagram who might be enhanced for lighting and all of that. Yeah. So, I mean, when you, when you follow people, maybe people that you idolize or people that you've been following for a long time on social media, there are tons of unrealistic expectations. You know, we're seeing these people who, first of all, you have, you have the whole situation with who's natural and who's not. And obviously people aren't going to come out and just say that there are some people who are honest with that and they don't have anything to lose. You know, a lot of people have sponsorships on the line and that's one of the reasons why they don't talk about it. But the people who blatantly lie about it, that's where we run into issues because people are young and impressionable. And when they see these kinds of physiques, they think it's attainable in a year or two years or three years of lifting. And we have naturals that have been lifting for 10 or 15 years and they look nothing like what these people think they're supposed to look like. So it just, it's like false hope. And that's not to say that if you're a natural, you can't get an incredible shape, but I think you need to really have an open mind when you're scrolling through your feed and you see these people and, you know, just don't get caught into the trap of comparing yourself with them or thinking that you can achieve that in a year or two. And yeah, you just got to be honest with yourself, you know? Yeah. I think it's, uh, <laughs> I always hate, to, I feel bad because I use Brad Loomis as an example a lot, but I don't feel too bad because I've had him on and we talked about it together, you know, so, and I know he, he agrees with this where he says he's the least genetically gifted of the 3DMJ crew. And, you know, for the people who say, oh, well, you know, they got that way by lifting for 20 years. This is what 20 years of dedicated training looks like, or this is what this or this. And it's like, I love using Brad as an example because he looks good. You know, he's, he's a pro. He said himself, he doesn't think he could go pro now, but at the time when he was competing more, you know, consistently, he, there was a, I guess it was less competitive. And so he was able to go pro and his calling card was being really, really lean, but he competes at about, I think 150 to 155. And, you know, I would say average ish, um, build. And you look at that and you're like, okay, he's been lifting consistently for 25 plus years now. He's got the best natural coaches pretty much around, right? He's got all the knowledge you could possibly have. And he competes at a similar height to somebody like Lane Norin and literally 40 pounds lighter. Now, I know a lot of people don't think Lane is natural. I have no idea. I don't know Lane that well. Um, but you're talking a 40 pound difference on stage. And there are people who would smoke Lane, you know? So mm -hmm. it's genetics is a huge thing. And that's probably the main point I have on this channel is, is how significant genetics are because it, it's a, it's a huge factor in it. Um, and then of course, yeah, there's the, the natty or not thing. That's just forever interesting to people, which I understand because, um, you know, I kind of have a, so much a somewhat of a forever grudge against uh, T Nation and uh, the guy Christian Thibodeau because mm -hmm. he was somebody who like on there he was just I guess I just like looked up to him and I thankfully never fell into like the BS trap of supplements that was one of the things like guys like Tom Venuto and and like that whole crew um, early on told me was or not told me directly but like in the stuff that I read saying that like that's not really worth your time so thankfully I I, I never fell into that but. You know, you'd see these routines they put out and there was this thing called eye bodybuilder that was supposed to simulate like eye robot and they hyped it up like crazy and he talked about how he put on like 20 pounds of muscle and everything and then all of a sudden you know a couple years later he had like severe kidney issues and it's like huh i wonder why so then after he had severe kidney issues he admitted that he did steroids one time like 20 years ago and i'm like dude you are 5'9 245 pounds shredded like as horrible as it sounds it's like when he got sick it's like i i almost didn't feel bad for him because it's like it's, again it, it is horrible but like it's like you're giving this message to a hundred well not thousands of people and it definitely affected me you know as a teenager and you get these people who uh they really have these false expectations and obviously if they are consistent they'll eventually learn all right the, like everybody eventually finds out that oh wait i'm not hitting remotely close to this but uh, i saw somebody defending michael hearn and they were like you know a year oh, into man. lifting probably right i mean that's that's of course like a really crazy one um and they were really like arguing on youtube and i'm like reading this and they're like you know this is just what happens like yeah i'm gonna blow past this you just watch like i'm just being consistent and you know i mean he's just a naive kid i'm not gonna like hate somebody like that i just i can't hit him too much because it's it's not their fault you know and this is kind of why we're talking about this because hopefully 
hopefully a few thousand people see this, you know, over time and, and they at least have somewhat more realistic expectations. And it is talked about by other people, you know, obviously you and I are talking about it. A lot of other people do talk about it, but I think it's a shame in the sense that it can really take away the enjoyment because some people would make the argument, why, why do you care? You know, why do you care who's natural or not? Why do you care about this person's weight and everything like that? And the reason I care is because I had like, that's kind of my personal objective in this space. It's like, no, I'm not going to be the guy telling you how to have like the strong, like world record deadlift because I've not been there. I'm not going to tell you the, like how to be the best number one bodybuilder you can be because I've not been there, but I can tell you how to make this a sustainable journey and something that you can actually enjoy because that's something that over the last 15 years I've really had to learn how to do. And I kind of was talking before about, you know, I think back to high school or before and I was like, oh man, it was nice to make gains. And I had that rosy retrospection of that time. But the reality is I know that as much as I can look back on that time favorably, it wasn't very enjoyable for me. It was actually very stressful because I never felt like I was gaining how I should have been. You know, I'd see a couple of the genetic elite in my, maybe not like overall genetically, but for my high school, you know, some of the people who had pretty solid genetics. And I was like, why don't I look like this? I'm, I'm so dedicated. What's going on? And maybe if I had people like us telling me like, hey, look, like this is what is normal. You know, this is the fact that you went from 135 to 160 in a year is great. You know, the fact that your arms went from, I don't know, 12 inches to 14 inches at the time is, is actually good progress, you know. Mm-hmm. But when you're comparing like that, it's, it's very hard to enjoy. So that's probably my main message to people is it's like not to say like set these low goals or not to try it, but try to enjoy the process because once you get to the stage that you and I are at it there's not really a lot more progress you know <laughs> unfortunately yep. um so th- that's kind of one of my my main messages out there yeah no I love that and you know I I always try and give people the benefit of the doubt but there were just some where it's like come on man like how do you go to sleep at night you yeah. know how, like how are you actually able to sleep knowing you're lying to so many people and I've, I've seen it so many times and you know it's, it's also very different now compared to when I was, you know, when I was in high school, there were just a a handful of people who, whatever they were taking at the time, right? So there was like, Finiflex was like one of the pro hormones that they were taking from a Mm. supplement shop, like under the counter kind of thing. And there were just those, those handful of kids, maybe four or five of them who were jack, like they looked nothing like the rest of us. Right, right, yeah. Now though, that's common. It's yeah. normal for a 17 and 18 year old to look like they've been lifting for 10 years. Right. And I think that should be, you know, eye opening to some of these people who are just getting into it. And, you know, unfortunately, there are so many people now when you just scroll through social media, you don't know who's lying, who's not. And you don't want to discredit someone's genetics. But you just again, you have to you have to be a realist when it comes to this sport. And there are some people who are genetically elite. And unfortunately, hard work does not beat great genetics. Like I know some people it's, and and people think that like, I know people who will run themselves into the ground during a prep. They will, everything will be on point from their sleep to their nutrition, to their recovery, to their supplementation. And someone could just show up one day who's been lifting for a year and they will just beat you. And they can maybe train three days a week and they eat McDonald's, you know, every other day. It doesn't matter. Like sometimes it's genetics are going to win and you have to be able to accept that. Yeah, which is really hard to accept because that's not what our culture like talks about at all, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we're kind of brought up from a young age, most people, that like, you know, you can do anything if you set your mind to it and all that crap. And it's like, yeah. I, I, yeah. this is like the most <laughs> it's like a depressing podcast because it's like, sorry, <laughs> change your dreams. You we got to give some people hope, man. <laughs> right, right. And it's like, look, like, and it, this, like I've said this in other podcasts too, this doesn't just apply to muscle growth. This applies to a lot of things, right? There are just some freak athletes out there right who, who aren't even muscular necessarily right where they might have i think eric trexler was talking about it on my last podcast where um he said that there was a guy who was a i think it was a mountain climber or something and he just had this ridiculous oxygen capacity that he was just like why can't these people keep up you know because it was just something you know he didn't work for that inherently it was just gifted to him um and i mean you see with other things intelligence there are people who just are crazy smart you know and they pick the right parents for that you know and Yep. I think I was just going to go that route when it comes to like business or education. There are people who they have a better memory than you. So you could sit there and you can study your ass off with all the flashcards and tutors and private help that you want. And this kid will just smoke you in it because he's just naturally gifted there. So 
yeah, you yeah. just you have to be able to accept that though. And some people were just bitter about it, and that's never going to get you anywhere yeah. in life. I mean, I'm still bitter about it. Let me be clear, <laughs> I'm still bitter over here. Okay, but, but this you is my venting it. process, <laughs> right? I unfortunately had to accept it. Yeah. Um, so I guess probably the main benefit I've had to my life with accepting it is getting some of my life back and not being so obsessive. So I, I kind of wanted to talk here about obsessive clients because that has been the best realization for me is when I realized that like, okay, I can really say that I put everything into it for about 10 years. Um, and I, I wouldn't say that now. I really don't, you know, I work out three days a week right now. It was four for a little while, but I, I really actually right now do like three days a week, I do three days a week of cardio. And I'm pretty much about the same size and strength. Obviously, it's a lot easier to maintain than it is to progress. Um, you know, I used to eat six to eight meals a day. Now I eat three, um, which I think is fine, even for somebody trying to maximize things. I think the research has now shown that that's actually fine. But for the most part, I just become much less obsessive. You know, I might have to miss a meal occasionally and not even like miss it. I might make up the calories, but it's just it's not a big deal for me. And I've been able to kind of like get some of my life back where it's like, oh, I'm, a little, I'm losing a little bit of sleep here. I don't do it much just because I get cranky, but um, I, I don't, you know, I don't want to like miss out on things in life. Um, probably one of the best examples of that was after I had dieted, this is now 2013. So this is kind of when I was coming around to being a little bit less obsessive. And I went to California with my family and I was literally like thinking like, I'm not going to eat anything on this trip. Like I'm just gonna eat like my healthy stuff. And then I realized like I'm in like, where was it? It was a uh, Palm Springs. And I'm probably never going to come back here. I'm at this amazing hotel. Like we're going to try food that I've never tried. Like, and I very fondly remember that trip now. And I can guarantee you that if I constantly ordered like chicken and broccoli about this trip, it would have been like half as enjoyable. You know, food is a big part of our life. So, um, how do you, when you have clients who are just completely obsessive, regardless of their goals, how do you deal with that? And, and do you just let them kind of wear themselves out with it? Or do you try to tell them early on, like, you know, yeah, well, th that's that comes down to really the initial consultation that I have with them and the application process. If if I notice any hint of disordered eating, uh, I I won't take them on as a client. I'll refer them out somewhere, or I'll let mm -hmm. them know that that is way outside of my scope of practice. Uh, I've dealt with it myself, so I probably spent a good man three to four years with like orthorexic behaviors. And mm -hmm. I know a lot of people might not know what that is, but essentially it's just, it's disordered eating patterns, right? So you're compulsive, like, and I'm not gonna diagnose anyone, but just some things to look out for. Like I was just like you, I couldn't go anywhere without, without my Tupperware, without my meals packed. If someone else prepared something, I got anxiety. Mm -hmm. It was actually really bad. And then you notice relationships suffer and friendships suffer and you're you're obsessively checking ingredient lists on every single food and you're spending hours every single day thinking about food and uh yeah it's it's unfortunately very common with physique competitors and bodybuilders because they use that disordered eating as a scapegoat because it's like it's part of the sport right it yep. shouldn't be that way unfortunately but and this was before i even got into uh doing a, a competition i i just became so obsessed with it and that obviously stems from my insecurities and being overweight and just wanting to change but right yeah man disordered eating is something that i i struggled with and it took years to overcome and that's why if if i notice any pattern of that with someone who potentially wants to work with me i let them know that that is something that's a little bit more serious than they might think and they should get it looked at but uh but for the clients that i do work with if if i notice anything throughout our time working together where they start maybe obsessing a little bit or they start getting anxiety we just have a long conversation and I let them know that, you know, one meal off plan is not going to get you fat. And just like the one salad you have, isn't going to get you shredded. Like you mm -hmm. need to be able to find that balance and it's not easy to do. And it's easy to say, like, just, just eat that pizza or eat that burger. It's not a big deal, but to some people it actually is a big deal. And for me, it was sure. something that I struggled with for a long time. So, yeah, it sounds like, Again, we, we have a pretty similar experience there. So I don't know if I would, I mean, I guess maybe you could have said orthorexic. I, I, would, I always just called it a bad relationship with food is mm -hmm. kind of what I had. So definitely in high school, it was the obsessive, like, not even just with food. I mean, I remember having my, so my brother was two years older, so he would like drive us around and look like our friends. And it was a Friday night and I had him drop me off at like 9 p.m. And I said I couldn't hang out with my friends because my dad would go to the gym at 5 a.m. on Saturdays. And that was how I got to the gym was through my dad. 
So to me, I'm like a warrior. I'm like so dedicated, you know, and to be honest, if I was super genetically gifted and I was winning like natural teen competitions, they would probably have a bio about me saying like, he's been so dedicated. He hasn't hung out with his friends. He does it. And it would be seen as a good thing. And, and to be honest, for that person, maybe it would be a good thing. If you have the genetic gifts to take something to that extreme, you know, like Ronnie Coleman, right? Obviously, you know, taking everything under the sun. But I bet he doesn't regret the extreme level that he took things, even though he can barely walk now because he was a true great. Muhammad Ali, I bet he doesn't regret his, you know, all the stuff he did because he was a true great. It was worth it for him. Because so many boxers have dementia and brain damage who nobody knows about, who never made it big at all because they didn't have the gifts to do so. So I actually do think that you might want to, to some degree, gauge your dedication to something based on how far you can go. And there's a lot of factors that would go into that. I'm just saying that for me, it was silly for me and my very average genetics to not hang out with my friends in high school because I had to get up at 5 a.m. to go work out. So things like, so it's not, basically I'm just saying it didn't just apply to food, it applied to kind of my whole lifestyle. Um, and, but like you, yeah, you see something that you don't know the macros on it just stresses you out. It's like, I'd rather just stick to my food because I know exactly what it is. So like I said, I, I never considered it like a full eating disorder. Maybe, maybe it was, but I just considered a bad relationship with food where I couldn't just kind of step away and enjoy things. And you're right. It's, it's extremely common in this endeavor. I mean, I see it all the time. I've had, I mean, it's not just, I mean, it's men and women. Traditionally eating disorders are more common in women, but I don't know if that would apply in this field. I mean, maybe because I talk to more guys, it seems like it's more even, but I know a lot of guys with it. Um, I know a lot of girls with it. And usually I will tell them, especially not to compete. Like if a girl is telling me that like she's been like bulimic or something before and she wants to get into competing, I've had a few where I was like, do not do that. Like I, I yeah. probably would never do that to be honest, because these things can be very triggering. Um, and you know, if you already have body images, body image issues, that's very tough to deal with. Yeah, there's a lot of psychology with it, man. And it's it's really hard for us to be honest with ourselves and find that divide between obsession and dedication. And a yep. lot of us just think it's it's dedication, it's commitment, it's discipline. But you got you you need to draw the line somewhere. Like there's a very big difference between being committed to something and giving up your entire life and letting it take control over you. And that goes with anything in life, but you know, regarding training and nutrition. But yeah, body image and body dysmorphia and all that is is underrecognized especially in in physique sport mm -hmm. uh, because you think people were so confident taking these shirtless pictures and posing all the time and posting all the stuff on on instagram but most people are just not willing to admit it or talk about it because it's, yeah. it's uncomfortable but i think the more people that step up and admit that they are normal and they have some insecurities the more people can feel at ease about it because it's easy to think that the people with a million followers who get 50,000 likes on every photo just right. feel good about themselves every day. But that is not the case at all, man. I know some people in the greatest shape ever who have tons of money and they are extremely insecure with how they look. They, they, they just take flattering photos, you know, to share. But yeah, I think it's almost more likely to be prevalent with those people than less, you know, people who you assume like, oh, they, they love how they look because X, Y, Z. I know two girls who probably have between 150 to 200,000 followers on Instagram. And, you know, I, I mean, I've talked to them. One of them I know quite well. The other one I've just talked to occasionally. And they are, I mean, they're definitely not like these like super secure people. You know, I think, I think very few people in this industry are, are super secure. Um, you know, one example I've given of my brother before was my brother was always very cocky. And he, like this was before he, he worked out. He was almost my height. He was like six feet tall and like 130 pounds, like very skinny. And he thought his body was great. He was like, well, yeah, I look better than you. What are you talking about? Like he just thought he had a great body. So now he's like eight years into lifting maybe. And he <laughs> like, he's like, I'm so fat. I'm so small. <laughs> like he, he is absolutely less confident in his body now than before he started lifting. So I mean, I'm not saying people shouldn't lift obviously, but it, it's like once you open that window, you just start to see things more and more. So do you find that that's something that you still deal with? Uh, the eating or the like the body, body image? image? Yeah. To some degree. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think we're ever going to be hundred percent satisfied with how we look. Yeah. And I guess I still, 
sometimes it creeps back up from when I was younger and those, those little insecurities come at me, but it's, it's very different now. Like I can go to the beach, I can go to the pool and I feel comfortable, mm -hmm. but there are certainly times where, I mean, you like, like we're talking about genetics, right? So I'm really good friends with a lot of the popular YouTubers out there and I've been probably training longer than them. I'm older than them. Mm -hmm. And if you put me in a room with them, they, we all take our shirts off and we start posing. I don't have like as lean as I get as conditioned as I am. I will never have that perfect six pack. Mm -hmm. I'll never have the perfectly rounded chest and all that. And yeah. some of these guys, it's like you get them all together. And it's like, how the hell do you all look like this? Like yeah. perfect in quotes, right. but, but yeah. So, so times like that, I'm kind of like, damn man, like, why not me kind of thing. Yeah. But, yeah. but yeah, I'm able to kind of brush it off because it's, you know, I've been, I've been at this for a long time and I know what's realistic for myself. I know what my genetics allow for and I know how hard I work. And that's, that's really all that matters, I guess, you know, because we're pressured to look a certain way and that could be to attract another individual, whether it's like a partner mm -hmm. or even just someone following you on social media. And it's a way for us to feel accepted. And, you know, so we need to learn how to, critique ourselves instead of criticizing ourselves. Like yeah, I, yeah. I got stuck in that negative self-talk loop and I was diminishing my self-worth because I tied my self-worth to how I looked for so many right. years. And yeah, that caused a lot of anxiety. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I don't think it ever completely goes away. And it's not just, I mean, everybody for the most part cares about how they look. And I also wouldn't want to be somebody who doesn't, you know, I mean, sometimes yeah. I'll have these patients who are you know, in their fifties and they're overweight. And I mean, they just do not care. Like I'll tell them like, you know, you're going to like literally lose all your teeth. And they're just like, yeah, well, whatever options cheaper. That's what I want to go with. And I'm like, I'm pretty far removed from that reality in the sense that like, I don't feel that way at all. Like I am like somebody who, who still wants to look as good as I can, like reasonably, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think one of the issues with steroids is that a lot of people, well, for one, I don't know if I could mentally handle like I used to be bigger than I am now. Um, I probably had maybe like 10 pounds more muscle. Um, I ran into some significant health issues that kind of hold me back now. Um, but even from that, it's hard for me to like, look at how I was compared to now. So I can't imagine if I was on like steroids and put like 30 pounds of muscle on or something like that. And then the come down from that later, I yeah. think it would be extremely psychologically difficult. Um, but also I still feel like, like if you had to have like a survey and body satisfaction among people who take steroids and people who don't, I would bet that the people who take steroids are not any more satisfied overall. Now there's obviously the confounding factor there that a lot of them probably took steroids because they were prone to not being satisfied with their body in the first place. But basically I'm just saying like, even if I gain that like 20 pounds of muscle, I'd probably be happy with my physique happier with my physique but would still find plenty of flaws you know what i mean like i'd still be obsessing about things that i didn't like and, and all that so it's like well great so i'm still just as content or not content but now i got to maintain this unhealthy regimen and everything so at least that, that's my justification for not wanting to start blasting a bunch of stuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it's almost like it doesn't it doesn't change who you are it amplifies who you are so it's the same thing when we talk about like finances Right, like as long as you're able to cover your needs and you have some disposable income to maybe go out on the weekend, grab dinner and not have to worry about it. If you made 200,000 more dollars, it's not going to make you a different person. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. It's like, it's like you add 20 pounds of muscle or you make 200,000 more dollars. It doesn't, it shouldn't fundamentally change who you are as a person. It should just amplify who you are. So if you're a nice person, maybe you'll be nicer and you'll donate more. Or if yeah. you're a shitty person, you'll just be greedy with it. And it's like, right, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's funny you say that. Cause I'm actually in that position in my career now where like, I'm only 28. So I definitely sound like a lazy, like millennial by saying, I don't want to work more, but I'm kind of in a position where it's like, I know I'll be happy with the amount of money that I could make even working like three days, maybe four. So because of my age, it's like, well, you should be working as much as you can. But it's like that money really, I mean, and it's not like this, my opinion. I mean, there's data out there showing that over a certain amount, you're really not happier, but you would probably be happier with more experiences, more relationships, you know, being able to like see loved ones and stuff more. So obviously that's, that's separate from fitness, but I guess in terms of, you know, life, <laughs> if we want to talk about that, it, I, I think there's a lot of ways that you, like a balance really helps and more muscle, more money, all these things 
they don't tend to actually make you more fulfilled in life really at all. Like that, the case I was telling you about um, before we started recording, you know, on that, that girl, like that was done for free. It took several hours, but that was way more reward. I know that's kind of cliche, like, oh, it's the smile that makes it worth it. But like, really, it really actually was it way is, more yeah. rewarding than like the money I would have gotten from that. So um, that's again, I, I realize that I'm kind of, it's a tangent there to kind of a rant. No, I, I like that though. Cause yeah. I, you know what? I, I don't know a lot of people in my personal life that are open about steroids. That's why I, I don't know shit about them. People ask me like questions about them. Sometimes I do an Instagram Q and A. I'm like, I don't know. And I don't care to research it because it's not mm -hmm. something I'm going to do. So I don't want to waste my time and energy trying to learn about it. But I would like to just sit down with some of them sometimes and just ask their why, you know, yeah. aside from medical reasons, whether it's TRT or whatever, but like, what's your actual reasoning? Because like, we're talking about, you know, money versus adding 20 pounds is like, if you if you decide to take steroids because you want to add 20 pounds of muscle like what is that going to do for you is is mm -hmm. it to get girls is it because you think you'll be more confident you know what i mean like i would love to get into the heads of some of these people because when you think about money you can use that extra money and buy luxury stuff like watches and shoes and designer shit and that probably won't make you that much happier Mm -hmm. but you could also use that money like you said and it can afford you new opportunities to do things like travel and whatnot when we talk about steroids adding 20 pounds of muscle like what other positives are there aside from just yeah. maybe you feeling more confident that's why i would love to like i'm just so curious as to why some people do it and everyone has their own reasons and i don't judge people for it but yeah. it is very interesting so i can talk on just my perspective so um unlike you it sounds like you were kind of always adamant about not doing it um, I can't say that that was the case for me. So I always felt, like I said, kind of that bitterness that I, I mean, I really like killed myself for probably the first 10 years, like from the time I was like 12 <laughs> until like my low twenties where, I mean, like I would do workouts that like personal trainers would come over to me and be like, are you okay? Cause like, I mean, I was like 13, like passing out on the floor and stuff. And, um, I really put everything into it. So I did feel it kind of. I don't know, like, like, this is not right. Like I've been, I put so much into it. And so I, and again, I, I, I'm a very curious person. I like to research things and delve into it. So I would say I know quite a lot about steroids actually. And I've read like literal whole textbooks on them and I've, I've delved into it. I've talked to a lot of people who have been on them. Um, and I would say if I didn't run into the, the health issue that I, I mentioned, I don't know if I, I would be on it just because the reason I said you have to maintain that for life a lot of the times or you lose it. And um, there's a, there's plenty of reasons that I wouldn't. But I will say that I've, I'm, I don't have any moral issues with it. And I definitely considered it strongly. I mean, I was really like delving into it. Um, and for me, my reason was a couple of things. One, because I just wanted to finally have the physique I felt like I, quote, deserved for all the work that I had put in. Um, and two, and this is actually probably a reason that changed as I got older, and if, if I was going to do it now, this would be the reason is that at least for some period of time, it would give me that passion and love again of the endeavor in terms of the progress, because like there was nothing better to me than going in there. And even if I had to like just kill myself for it, if like after a couple of weeks, I could add five pounds to that bar and I could see that progress because the reality is like at six, one 190 to 200 pounds, like. I'm muscular to most people, most normal people. You know, if I cared about getting with more girls, the actual the extra muscle at that point isn't going to do that much. You know, I mean, having a good job and being tall is, is already like <laughs> half of it. <laughs> so a lottery already. <laughs> yeah, right. So it, it's like <laughs> that isn't realistically going to do that much for me. It, it's really not. I mean, of course, the ego boost would be nice, but for me, I now when I was younger, it was more so the ego boost. Now that I'm older. If it was like, you know, somehow it was it was just a cost thing, right? It was just about the money and it, like as far as like buying steroids and it, there was no health issues or no legal issues. The reason that I would do it would just like I said, to have that love back to that, to, like, to see the progress, to see myself growing. Oh, man, I put a quarter inch, even if it was over six months that, to get, have some progress. You know what I mean? Um Because I don't know the last time I really gained. I mean, I actually I did hit an overhead press PR recently, which was like. You know, any type of PR at this point that's not like a random machine or something is nice. Um, I did neck training start like two years ago just because like I was kind of interested. I wanted to try it. And my neck went from like, you know, not it was never it was went from like skinny to maybe like normal. So it was like 15 and a half up to like 16 and a quarter to gain three quarters of an inch 
on any circumference, I was like, wow, like, you know, my arms haven't grown in forever. My thighs haven't. So that that's why I would do it. So I don't, I don't know what other people's reasoning would be, but, and of course that wouldn't last forever either. But you know, if you could eke out another five, 10 years of that, to me, it, it would be very rewarding, I think. But for the health reasons, I wouldn't personally do it. That's super interesting. I've never really heard that perspective before. It obviously makes sense because, yeah, as as a natural, there's, there's only so much we can do. And sometimes I actually find myself going back to basics and I'm like, maybe I am not seeing the progress that I think I could be seeing because I, I, maybe I'm doing something wrong. Maybe I could tweak my, my form a little bit. So yeah. I'll find myself like kind of starting over to see yeah. if I can. <laughs> see, and I, I do that too. And that's, I, I convince myself that that's all BS because like, it still happens. <laughs> I'll still see an article sometimes. Like, you know, even like now there's like the talk I'm like, you, you know, Greg Doucette. Yes. Yeah. And he, I guess, blown up a lot in like the last year. And like, man, I've, yeah, I'm sure you're in the same boat. We've read so many articles and like, you know, I mean, I studied it in college. I've talked to so many people. I know what works and yet I'll hear a new guy talking about, you just need to train to complete failure. Like, you know, he's getting out there screaming and everything. And I'm like, maybe that's what I need to do. Like, like, it's just, you almost want to convince yourself, like, you know, maybe there is something. Yeah, very and it's convincing. Like, yeah. Right? And like, you just think like, maybe I'm missing something. And I don't know, maybe we disagree, but I think, I don't think we're missing anything. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'm just filling my head up. Yeah. Most of the time I will say, yeah, I think I think the information that we've gathered from some of the people we follow is correct. Uh, I don't I really try not to get too wrapped up in in the science. Like I love it. I think mm -hmm. evidence base is cool. I think it's cool that it, that's popular now. But some people, they're, they're just taking it too far. You know, it's like who gives a shit if this EMG showed this and this should, mm -hmm. like it doesn't do the exercises that you enjoy if you're not progressing with them. If they're not comfortable for you, then stop doing them. Yeah. Uh, I do think maybe there are some things that you can tweak a little bit. Like, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, with N1 coach Kasim or Kasim on Instagram. Oh, is he Indian? No, oh, who am I thinking of? no. He, so Indian, it's, no. it's N1 training. Um, he, he used to, I mean, this is a couple of years ago. He used to work for MI 40 with Ben Pakulski and everything. And they kind of okay. parted ways, whatever. But anyway, he is, a he's like a super intelligent guy when it comes to biomechanics or training. And his Instagram is packed with pretty much telling everyone why they're doing exercises wrong. Yeah. And it did actually make me think a little bit. And I've tried some of the stuff that he's implemented and sure enough, there are, man, goes my phone again. Uh, there are little things that, that I've tried and I was actually kind of shocked with yeah. like, yeah. But, and, and they're just, they're simple little things. Like it's not like I'm just going to magically grow from it. Right. But just to be able to hit a muscle more efficiently by learning a little bit more about it. Like, for instance, like a lat pull down, right? Like the traditional lat pull down that we all know, the way most people do it is really like an upper back pull down. And in order mm -hmm. to hit the lats, like you kind of want your elbows in front of you and pulling down like this. So he shows yeah. different variations of how to make those movements target certain muscles. And that's kind of helped me a little bit in terms of ensuring that I'm hitting the target muscle. But again, nothing magical is going to come out of it. I'm not just going to magically grow three inches on my arms. But have you learning little things any, like that. Have you noticed any physical changes? Like I'm sure you can like feel things more. Have you, it's hard to be objective, obviously, but do you think you've actually seen physical progress since doing anything like that? Or do you, it's more like you can just feel it? I would say my back has grown. Okay. I actually, I just recently got off a uh, call with, I was talking with uh, Steve Hall from Revive. Really? And he's someone that I, I just really respect and he's super honest. And I, I sent him uh, some photos and videos of me like in very unflattering lighting first thing in the morning mm -hmm. and then uh, at the gym. And he gave me some very honest critiques and he said like he was, he was impressed by my width and my back. And I always thought my lats were like a huge weak point. I just, mm -hmm. maybe just because I don't know how to flare them right, but he yeah. assessed my physique and I told, I was like, dude, don't sugarcoat anything. Like, mm -hmm just criticize the shit out of it and let me know like the, the truth yeah. and yeah what he was saying was things that i never thought so i would say yeah a little bit has helped me but but again it's maybe that's what i tell myself to make training fun yeah i don't know well, that's that's what I, the probably the last topic we'd finish up on um but real quick so was it a coaching call with steve or was it a podcast no it was just a friendly okay Skype call yeah gotcha because i was gonna say because he and i i thought you were saying um, you were doing a podcast together and I was just going to laugh because 
I think like three or four times now we've had the same guest released like accidentally in like the same weekend. And I thought it was going to happen again. I was like, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were just chatting. <laughs> yeah, no, Steve's, Steve's a cool guy. Um, yeah. I think we're talking next week, actually, or two weeks from now. Um, so, but anyway, that, that's a great topic to kind of finish up on is as a natural where, so what, how long has it been for you? Has it been about 15 years as well? Maybe training. Yeah. 12 to 15, I would say, again, you know, the whole, like the first five, six, seven years. Yeah. Of bullshit. Yeah. yeah. So I would say a good eight or nine years of like quality lifting, maybe okay. a little bit longer. Yeah. So at that point, what do you do to try to stay interested in lifting? Honestly, just like, how do you stay motivated, you know, besides changing how you do lap pull downs? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I truthfully, I guess some of these guys, like the 3DMJ guys, like I, I love uh, Jeff Alberts, man. Mm -hmm. I love the simplicity of his training style and the fact that he trains in his garage and he's still continuing to improve year after year. And there are guys like that that just motivate me. Like even, even the genetically elite that mm -hmm. already look incredible, they're still busting their ass in the gym just to get that little bit extra. So I know that I can improve a lot more. I've, I've, and I'm guilty of this, even though I've been training for 10 years, I've also spent many of those years kind of spinning my wheels because again, I worried about, oh, I don't want to bulk too much because I want to mm -hmm. stay lean. And we get trapped into this like lean bulk thing where yeah. it's cool to stay leaner while bulking, but the, the diminishing returns, like you, you need to be able to just kind of cross that path. Of like, okay, you, you need to stop being so lean so you can actually make progress. Mm -hmm. And I got stuck trying to do that lean gaining thing for so many years, even up until recently. So now I, uh, this past winter, I finally like pushed my calories and noticed some uh, differences in my training. And I'm going to take like another year. I want to give myself a good, like solid year to year and a half of consistent surplus, maybe the mini cut here and there, but really go all in with it and see, because again, I've never really tried to push my weight over 190 ish. Okay. I was so, going to ask, what do you think you'll go up to? Yeah. I, <laughs> my wife goes, Oh, get to like 220. I'm like, <laughs> let's be a fat fucking. <laughs> yeah. Let's just say, I, I would like to see how I look at 200. And again, that's, that's 20 pounds. So I know yeah. most of that's not going to be muscle, but I'm curious to see, like maybe I just spend some time focusing on strength and just see how that goes. But yeah. I'm really curious to see. So you got to take some measurements and write down your strength numbers now, because I'm curious to see after you bulk up how you are when you cut back down, because that's kind of like the true test of it. Because mm -hmm. um, I've I was up to 220. And like I said, I'm never going to get back muscularly to where I was probably. Um, but even at, I mean, at 220, I was pretty damn soft. And I but I don't regret it because I really don't think I netted much from like my biggest bulk and cut. Basically, I would do a yearly bulk and cut. And what I decided to do was like, all right, this is like my final dreamer bulk. Like I'm going to do it on a two year cycle. So one and a half years bulking, six months cutting basically. And by the time I had dropped like half the weight, it seemed like I was going to maintain maybe like one to two pounds more muscle than I had before. Um, but by the time I got down to like as lean as I had previously gotten, like over the summer, most of it was gone, maybe half a pound of muscle or something like that. Um, but I don't regret it because I got to hit the, some of the strongest numbers I've ever hit. You know, I think I was doing, actually, I could probably beat this if I did like a specialization phase, but I was doing 225 for like, like on bench for maybe 17 reps or something like oh, that. Um, which I definitely, I mean, but even now I can still do like 10 or 11, which I haven't been focusing on it because I have been doing like the overhead press specialization. But even recently, like I kind of bulked up again to like, that and I guess that would be my point on how I've kind of maintained some motivation, which can't last forever. But I've I've picked certain lifts to really focus on because I did squat bench and deadlift for like 15 years. I don't focus on those as much because I just know I'm not going to hit those numbers again for the most part. But overhead press, I never really specialized in or even like really tried to. So recently hitting like I think I got 205 one week and then like a couple weeks later, I got like 210 and then I've gone up like my goal was 225 and I probably could have done that when I was at my strongest in bench, but if I focused on it, but I, I wasn't focused on it at all, you know, same thing with like pull-ups. Like now I'm trying to hit like a max reps pull-ups, you know? So the most I ever did with admittedly sloppy form was 30. So maybe I could do, you know, 32 or something just so kind of picking lifts. I don't want to get to the point that I'm trying to get like a machine curl PR or something and caring about that, <laughs> <laughs> but 
if there are some of these lifts that are more unique, it's kind of like Eric Helms recently switched to strongman. Yeah. Right. Yep. And, you know, again, he says on the podcast, I'll be releasing probably this coming weekend. Um, he said himself that he doesn't, he's not really gaining new strength and muscle, but he's learning a new skill and that's keeping him motivated. And he can probably improve at his strongman lifts for probably years. Right. And that gives him something new and fun to do. Yeah, no, I, I'm glad you brought that up. Actually, that's something that I recently did was introduce a few new movements that I either I haven't done in a while or I just avoided because I hated them because they were challenging. Mm -hmm. So for instance, like the good morning, I never liked mm -hmm. that exercise, right? Yeah, I was doing yeah. plenty of RDLs <laughs> and all that, but, but I suck at it. And it's so new to me that watching myself progress with it actually feels good. So yeah. it's nice to do the things that you're not good at because your progression is much faster. So I, I don't know where I'm going to go with it. I, I toyed around with the idea of possibly doing something with powerlifting, but I just, I dealt with injuries in the past and I, I don't know if I want to go down that road. You know, I, yeah, I think my one goal was like a, a deadlift goal and I hit five fifteen, and I was like, Oh, cool. That's, that's enough. Nice. I, yeah. yeah. But, but I, my, my shoulder isn't great. So I don't want to, I'm not going to push myself or shit like that, but yeah, we're getting old, doing, man. Yeah, man. Sucks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I, yeah. that's why I don't, I, I did a lot of ego lifting in my day and, Ugh, the fact that I even say like in my day just aged me twenty years. What but, is your what's your audience like like young twenties or are they close um, to our if age? If I look at like the YouTube stats, it's actually pretty evenly distributed. There's like quite I forget it, how they break it down in like I think they do every five years or so on like the YouTube stats, but I think there's a pretty even spread between like fifteen to nineteen, like twenties and then thirties, and then it drops off a little bit after that. So no, I'm probably about my average audience's age um okay. roughly yeah. but uh but yeah just now that i have hit some of those numbers like you like i hit a triple body weight uh deadlift you know i was 170 pounds at the time but i was still pretty happy with it and after that it's like man like stuff starts breaking me and like i know like when i was young man i would refuse to listen to anybody who said like they were bad for you. Like my dad was like, do you really need to lift that much? And I was like, no dad, deadlifts are good for you. Like, meanwhile, I can barely put my socks on because I kept like <laughs> breaking my back. And like, admittedly, there are safe ways to do it for sure. Um, but I don't know, man. I mean, Lane Norton's got a ton of knowledge and he keeps breaking his body on these deadlifts. And again, I'm not trying to hate on Lane. I, I like Lane. I'm just saying, as an example, you can, ha you can be very knowledgeable and still get very hurt. I mean, I think Eric Helms has said powerlifting is basically... What do you say? Something like powerlifting is basically like you agreeing to like slowly deteriorate your body. You know, just over time, things are going to happen. I don't, I don't know many successful powerlifters who don't have some injuries. Um, and especially given my career, like I just I can't afford to throw out my back and like close down my office. You know, it just wouldn't wouldn't be a good look. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a huge ego thing. I mean, you hear people say like you have to squat, you have to deadlift, and I'm like. Let me put you in a hack squat for three sets and you won't be able to walk for like a week. Yeah, yeah, seriously. You know, so, yeah, uh, well, I guess we're, we're just old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, keep, keep me up there. I'm interested to see how that bulk goes. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, 220 would be tough, but man, yeah, I think yeah, you know, nah, I'm not even 200 well, probably. I'd like to see 200 next year. So what I, what I plan on doing is kind of hanging out where I'm at, pushing calories a little bit more, and um, – as we approach, well, probably the next couple of months, maybe mini cup for the summer, like a little bit of the summer. And then once like September comes around, commit to another year or so of it. We'll see. I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't well, plan I'm that on, far ahead. I'm on my way down right now. So we'll like meet at 190 and we'll have, you'll, you can come in, be my patient. We'll do a pose down and we'll go get a lift. It'll be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> all right man well this was great thank you for talking and where can people find more of your stuff no nah, man thank you so much for having me on i appreciate it uh really just maddie fusaro at anything instagram uh twitter youtube facebook uh yeah website fusarofitness.com so that's pretty much it perfect thanks man thank you